share in a holy, holy way. Oh, let me love in a holy, holy way. Let me love, let me love in a holy, holy way. Oh, let me love in a holy, holy way. Let me love, let me love in a holy, holy way. All right, let's go practice that. Love on each other. Shake a hand, get a hug. Introduce yourself to someone you don't know. As we move into this morning's contemplation time, I invite you to take out your cell phones. Please check into social media, Facebook, Twitter, all the other fun ones, Snapchat. <laughs> make a cute little video of yourself. And then make sure those cell phones are silent so that we're not disturbed for the rest of this morning's celebration. Thank you. So let's begin with this morning's, this week's affirmation from your program. You might choose to cut it out as a reminder of your truth, of your being, and post it somewhere where you can see it regularly this week. So let's say this together. God is infinite consciousness. God is my mind and consciousness. My experience of supply, health, harmony, and wholeness come from God within me as me. And now I invite you to take a nice deep breath and let the music take us into a silent place, followed by this morning's invocation. to be still and let God love me I need to be still let God love me when this old world starts to push and shove me I need to be still let God love me I need to relax Let God take over I need to relax Let God take over And take this load off of my shoulder to relax and let 
God take over I need to be still and let God love me I need to be still and let God love me when this old world starts to push of me I need to be still and let God love me I need to be still and let God love me And so it is in the stillness that I remember who and whose I am. That I am love made manifest. That I am the beloved. And in this realization, the world cannot push and shove me. For I am the presence of the one here and now. And so anything that appears separate or as other cannot come near me, cannot affect me, cannot blow me down. For where I am, the presence of God is, and the place upon which I stand is holy ground. For I am living in the one as the one. My life is the presence of God, the life of God. And I simply surrender into that knowing. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know. And so I live from this place daily. I die daily to the old way of being and I am born into eternal life. The eternal life realized when I realize my oneness. And so the load is taken from me. And I know that I know that I know that love is all there is that God is all there is. And so this day I give thanks and I rejoice in the glory and the magnificence and the power and the presence of love, of spirit, of God. And I know that all is truly well. because it must be so. I give thanks for it, and I let it be, and so it is. Right here, right now. 
summertime in the winter. <laughs> Except I'm sweating like it's summertime, so it's all good. Woo! Why is that? Is it warm in here? Is it warm in here or is it just me? It's warm in here. Thank you, all of you of a certain age who just answered that way. <laughs> I really appreciate that. <laughs> That's our theme for November. What just passed was our theme for the year, our global theme, which we and um, 130 or so other centers for spiritual living around the world are, are, are moving through for the whole year of 2016. It's, it's about creating a world that works for everyone. How do we do that? Every month we have a theme to focus on. This month is wholeness. Today I'm talking about the eternal soul. And the idea for that, the idea of, that I want to focus on today of the eternal soul really does fit in well with November's theme of wholeness because of how I defined, I didn't define it, Webster's defines wholeness, but the first Sunday of the, oh look, a new table, this is nice. I should go away more often, we get new furniture. Um, so, um, about how wholeness is defined in the dictionary. Wholeness is defined as the state of being complete, undivided, not broken. So we, I, or not broken or damaged. And so we understand that to be the truth of God, this idea of wholeness, complete, undivided, not broken or damaged. And we also believe that to be the truth of God's creation. What is God's creation? Us, everything. Everything is a creation of God. Everything that is in form, everything that is tangible, everything that is possible, it's all God. And so what is true of God is true of God's creation. And therefore, wholeness is the truth of us, certainly but of all of creation. And since that is an attribute of God and an attribute of us, it is the truth of us, as is every other attribute of God, including immortality, eternality. It's an always kind of thing. We are the creations of the living God. God is a God of the living, as Jesus said, or is quoted as saying in Scripture. And we, as creations of God, reflect spirits, God's image, likeness, and nature. And so we have, in our faith, we have what we now call a Declaration of Principles. It was originally written by the man who put this faith and philosophy together. He's a man named Ernest Holmes. And he wrote it as a what I believe statement back in the 1920s. We have since broadened the language and included it as our statement, our Declaration of Principles. And in that, it says, we believe in the eternality, the immortality, and the continuity of the individual soul forever and ever expanding. And so the idea here that it says of individual soul, that's, that's us. That's one of the things that we have as creations of God. We have an individual. But the word individual should not imply separate. It's really individualized. Each of us is an individualized incarnation of spirit, an individualized soul, but forever one with spirit. We are always one with that. We are always one with that which created us. And that is true always and forever. And do you know how long forever is? Really, really long. It's a really, really long time. But the idea so that each of us is, and, or has, but is, an individualized soul forever and ever expanding. That is so because everything that is created is that. You know, science is now telling us that the universe, while they thought for, that it would expand for well, quite a while longer, but at some point in the way distant future, start to fall in upon itself. Now they are saying, no, it actually looks like it's going to continue to expand forever. And that's a really long time. So the universe continues to expand forever. Our individualized souls as creations of God, these are also forever and ever expanding, becoming more like that which created us, just as the universe is. So we are following after the nature of all creation as souls created by the one. So forever and ever expanding. This is what we have to dive into, to focus on, to understand, to begin to believe and live and practice and that's amazing. So we are creations of the living spirit, and the truth of us as souls is immortal as well. And so we see in, hi, Valeri. Let's go back a minute. Hmm, okay. Well, we do that too. But in this, it says, in the Science of Mind, which is the book Ernest Holmes put together, he says, we are not going to attain immortality. We are now immortal. Now. Our contention is not that dead men live again, but that a living man never dies. Now, Ernest Holmes wrote after the style of his time, but living, a living soul, a living person never dies. Yes, we have an experience physically, bodily death. Sometimes in this faith, we call it a transition. 
But we are that now. We are immortal now. We have nothing that we have to do to earn it, to deserve it, to be awarded it. Immortality is the reality of our soul, which is forever and ever expanding. So I got to spend some time with family over the holiday this week. Something that I, up until now, have not done a lot of, and which I am changing right now, because I had some pretty powerful revelation about, about family and connection and those kinds of relationships. But being with family, once again, afforded me the opportunity, once again, to witness the beauty of biology, yes, but also the wisdom of spirit. You know, the infinite wisdom of that intelligence and pure energy that created us after its own image and likeness. And that wisdom, and in that wisdom, the only thing sure beyond the eternal nature of our soul is change. Have you ever noticed that? The only thing you can absolutely be sure of is that things change. I spent a few days this week not shaving. And I looked in the mirror on that fourth day, and besides being shocked at my father's face staring back at me, my beard is all white now. That's a change I was not thrilled to see, so I shaved it immediately. But this, this is the thing. This is the thing that we can be assured of, that change is the reality that we inhabit. Once again, in The Science of Mind, Ernest Holmes wrote, nature will not let us stay in any one place too long. She will let us stay just long enough to gather the experience necessary for the unfolding and advancement of the soul. Again, it is forever and ever expanding. He says, this is a wise provision, for should we stay here too long, we would become too set, too rigid, too inflexible. Nature demands the change in order that we may advance. And when the change comes, we should welcome it with a smile on the lips and a song in the heart. When was the last big change that you welcomed with a smile on your lips and a song in your heart? <laughs> Just checking, anyone, anyone at all? Except a positive one that you were planning? <laughs> now, in that passage, Ernest Holmes is talking about the change that we call bodily death or physical transition. But the truth of the matter is, when we look at it from the perspective of et eternality, of forever, it becomes really apparent that in this lifetime, there are so few things truly to, to resist at all costs, to be afraid of, to, to do anything like that. It was... Um, an opportunity, it is an opportunity for us to get that broader perspective. Again, being with family this week, being among them, and actually having some experience of seeing photographic history that I had never before seen of family reminded me of the vast and profound changes we, changes we experience in this physical lifetime. I mean, if you just cast your glance back over your life from a certain point that your mind lands on in this moment until now, it just... Consider the vast and profound changes that you, have, that you have lived through, that you have addressed, that you have either faced or, or welcomed or triumphed. We have all, all lives have those changes. And yet here we still are. And when you, when you look at the, the, the life that you've had, whatever the challenges may have been, whatever the glories may have been, whatever the ease and the difficulty may have been, you did it. We're here. Give yourselves a hand. You're here today. All right. Woohoo! Hallelujah. It means that there is very, very little that we can't move through. There's very little to resist, to be afraid of, to, to, to tremble in fear of. Not only in this lifetime, but in the context of forever and eternal. And in the case of the change that Holmes is referring to, that we should welcome with a smile on our lips, if we truly believe in the continuity of the soul, if we believe that our soul is immortal and eternal and forever and ever expanding, then even that change isn't something that we need to resist or to dread. In, in visiting with family, I had some time, uh, some extended time to visit with my eldest sister-in-law, and she is a woman who has had her fair share, or maybe more than her fair share, of people cl very close to her transitioning into the next experience. She is not... Uh, that I know of, she is not a woman of, of any particular faith. I don't, she pra I don't think she practices any particular faith. But something that she was sharing with me so resonated with what my experience is and what I believe. You know, and she says that when, when she is with a person who does that bodily death, who has that physical transition, and when the soul no longer is anywhere near that physical form, she very much understands and believes that that person is no longer there. You know, that that... That, that, that whatever made them them, that isn't it. 
And that's what my experience is as well. My experience of that, of, of having someone near or, or being near someone who, who made that transition, and then when that departure happens, it's like, it proves to me. It, it, it is a very felt and, and understood sense within me that knows that, that whoever I am when I say I, whoever you are when you say you, we are not our bodies. There is something far beyond anything we can see that is that. And that's the idea of the soul. That is the, the thing that... that, that that individualizes in this experience, in this body, as who you know as me and I know as you, but that is far beyond that physical presence and that physical appearance. And that is what continues on. And, that, and the proof of it is, is the, the memories and the, the felt sense that you have for someone that you've been close to that is present with you and very real for you long after they have passed, right? It's there. That is the, the them that is the truth of them. That is the pure energy of spirit which created each one of us. That is the reality of who we are. And long after we pass out of this form and experience, that is still the reality of who we are. So I think the general intention that I, that I have with you this morning is to broaden our perspective in such a way that, that we can have a larger context in which to live our lives today in which to live to the fullest degree possible. It's to deepen our understanding of, of forever enough. I don't know that anyone can really grasp forever in their minds, but to expand or deepen our understanding enough that any fear or trepidation that you may carry with you when you came in this morning of whatever the hereafter is, whatever the experience is beyond this time, to ease that enough so that we can more fully appreciate and enjoy our wholeness in the eternal here and the everlasting now so that today right now which truly is all the time that we have is more fully understood and lived and enjoyed because if indeed the truth of us is eternal that our souls are eternal if you think about it in that span of time and what do we say eternal is a long time forever is a long time doesn't that mean that there's enough time for everything does anyone feel like they're in a hurry Especially maybe this time of year as it starts to gear up. Or if, like Mary, you've been finished for two months. Does anybody feel fin hurried, rushed through life? It's sort of like if we understand that forever is the truth of us, it might give us some new perspective on living today. Again, in the science of mind, Ernest Holmes says, time heals all wounds. And in one of my um, incarnations in, in uh, reading this passage, I wrote in the margin, and it wounds all heals. You know, people who do you wrong, time will get them. So time heals all wounds. <laughs> it's the law. Time heals all wounds and wounds all heals. That's my addition. Adjusts conditions, explains facts, and time alone satisfies the expanding soul, reconciling the visible with the invisible. We are born of eternal day, and the spiritual sun shall never set upon the glory of the soul, for it is the coming forth of God into self-expression. Our soul is the coming forth of God into self-expression. We must give ourselves time to work out all the problems. If we do not work them out here, we shall hereafter. There will be enough time in eternity to prove everything. So... Don't feel like you need to have your life all wrapped up in a nice, neat little package with a bow on top and shipped off to someplace final. If you don't resolve it all here, you got time. <laughs> However that looks in the next expression, in the next experience, whatever problems go with you, and I'm not sure any do, but whatever that is, there's time enough. There is time enough in eternity to prove everything. And another passage near this, this section of the Science of Mind book, which is, the section is called Immortality, and you ought to read it because it's a really cool and, and really powerful um, expression of, of what these truths are. But near that passage, it's also reminiscent of a point we, of a focus we had a few months ago where it said, you know, the, one of the goals of human life is a complete emancipation from all discord of every nature, right? You want to be free of all discord. And he says, and that goal is sure to be attained by all. Of course, in eternity, there's enough time to get there. But, um, but just like that, in, in a passage near this last one I shared, he said, we may be certain that all will arrive at the final goal, that not one will be missing. Every person is an incarnation of God. The soul can no more be lost than God could be lost. All will arrive at the final goal. Not one will be missing. So left behind, 
is not our, is not our belief. Not one will be missing. We are all going to the same place. And that same place is just reunion, conscious union with our source. Yeah, we can tap into it while we're here. Yeah, we can have those mystical and numinous experiences and moments where we're living in conscious union with God. That's the mission of this set of spiritual living to inspire that in us. But we sometimes forget. But the ultimate goal, the ultimate experience is reunification, is conscious union. No separation ever. And that we're all going to get there. So let's stop trying so hard. We're all going to get there and learn to appreciate and enjoy the ride more. In looking at some of these ideas for today, I came across the story of a woman named Anita Morjani. Has anybody ever heard of her? She wrote a book called Dying to Be Me about her experience, and it was fascinating. And this is an unusual experience, I think. Not, Not a lot of people have this experience, but it's one of the ones where you hear about it and you go, this is possible. So back in 2006, early 2006, she had been given just hours to live. She had arrived at a hospital in a coma in February of 2006. Um, She couldn't move. She had had, had been experiencing um, Hodgkin's lymphoma for almost four years. She was at end stage of that, 4B. She couldn't walk. Her body couldn't absorb the nutrients from the food. There were lesions all over her body. She was shutting down. Everything was happening. So she, and she went into a coma as a result. And the doctors did not expect her to live through the night um, in the ICU in the hospital. Um, and during that time, she had what, what is known in the trade, I guess, as an NDE, a near-death experience. And I, I would imagine there are some people present today who have had that experience. Um, As a result of all of that, five weeks after she went into the hospital, she walked out on her own, and there was no sign of cancer in her body. Five weeks. So since doing that, since walking out of that hospital, and I looked it up because I didn't know, the book has been written some time ago, so I looked her up. She's still doing, she's still speaking and touring and writing and doing all sorts of stuff 10 years later. Um, Since walking out of the hospital, she has lived every moment of her life fully wholehearted, and without any fear of of dying. Absolutely not, because she is living. So a couple of things that she writes. She says, there I was without my body or any of my physical traits. This is her near-death experience. Yet my pure essence continued to exist. And it was not a reduced element of my whole self. In fact, it felt far greater and more intense and expansive than my physical being. Magnificent, in fact. I felt eternal, as if I'd always existed and always would without beginning or end. That is the soul experience. The soul is the pure energy of God. It was never created and it can never be destroyed. That is what energy is. That is what our soul is. A little while later she says, I I became aware that we are all connected. This was not only every person and living creature, but the interwoven unification felt as though it were expanding outward to include everything in the universe. Every human, animal, plant, insect, mountain, sea, inanimate object, and the cosmos. I realized that the entire universe is alive and infused with consciousness, encompassing all of life and nature. Everything belongs to an infinite whole. I was intricately, inseparably enmeshed with all of life. We are all facets of that unity. We are all one, and each of us has an effect on the collective whole. Each of us has an effect on the collective whole. I look at someone with an experience like that, and I sometimes wish it were a more universal experience, and yet, somebody having that experience and having the physical transformation that she had, I think she speaks with some authority about this idea of unity and eternality and everything being one and expanding. And that is so what she knows. She knows it in a way that can never be disproven to her or taken away from her. And if indeed, as she says, each of us has an impact on the collective whole, and we would believe the same thing in this faith and philosophy, then it becomes obvious to me that we should have a beneficial or a positive effect on the collective whole. And in the context of this idea today, how do we do that best? I think we do it best by living fully now. Living fully now, today. Not to wait for some eventuality that may not ever happen. Retirement. Financial freedom the perfect partner, perfect health, the stars and planets in the correct alignment for your moon sign. (laughs) That may never happen. Why delay the experience of living this life as magnificent as it is, as messy as it can be, 
as, as, as glorious and as painful and all of those things that go into the human life stream, why put off living more fully now? I think we should live so that you've probably heard about, there's a writing called The Dash. How did you live your dash? The dash is the, the, the space between your beginning date and your end date here on earth, right? I think we should live so that the dash is jam-packed, full of living, full of life, full of light, full of enthusiasm, full of wonder, full of beauty, full of awe, full of curiosity, full of learning, full of challenging. It's full to the brim with life and light. A magnificent book from Ernest Holmes. If you read no other book by Ernest Holmes, read this one. It's called This Thing Called You. In it, he says, the soul is the one triumphant, indestructible, and unconquerable thing you possess. Shot from the invisible into this experience, it constitutes your great reality. But why wait for physical death to enjoy and experience your immortal being? Do not prepare to die. Prepare to live. Whether you are 10 years old or 100, there is no death. It is impossible for you to die. Stop trying to die and learn to live. Yeah. I think that is really wonderful advice, especially for those of us who, as we age, I don't know about you, but every so often I tend to contemplate mortality a little more than I used to. It's kind of a natural way of, and then I remind myself, oh yeah, I'm immortal, never mind, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go act like a child some more, so. Um, <laughs> but I think that's wonderful advice. Stop trying to die and learn to live. It's up to each one of us to the best of our ability to learn that, to learn to live life to its fullest. Let's not wait for the experience of immortality, whatever lies beyond this earthly experience. Let's not wait for that to realize more completely our wholeness now. We truly are complete, undivided, not broken or damaged. That is true for all of us, and it does not matter what has happened in your life. You are complete. You are perfect. You are not broken, and you are not damaged. Let's know that here. Let's know that here for ourselves and for one another so that then we can go out into our lives beyond this place and shine that light. That light is so attractive. It brings people to you in such a way that you can shine that light. And as you know your wholeness, it can show up for them. That is the way that it works from the inside out, from this place out there. And it's a beautiful way to create a world that works for everyone. And so it is. Namaste. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Ah, it's good to be back. All right, so we're going to, like, 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 we're going to move, like, into our sharing of our... <laughs> I was just trying to remember what was next. I remember now. We're going <laughs> to... We have an opportunity to share of our, of our gifts, our, our financial um, gifts. You know, as we... Um, as I shared earlier this morning and we, we talked last week, we, we have a, a local community partner every month uh, of the year that we support not only financially but with our, with our time and talent as well. We, we serve a local charity in the community. This month it has been Toys for Tots, which is a great, great, great organization. Um, and your gifts help us support that. Your gifts help us support the international centers for spiritual living around the world so that we can continue to grow this faith and philosophy and let more people know we exist. And it continues to fund this place and its vision of a world that works for everyone, its mission of inspiring conscious union with God. All that we are is in place and active to nourish those of us who are here and those who come because they found out internally or externally that we exist. So I appreciate your giving this morning. I invite you to hold your gift uh, near your heart. If you give electronically or some other way to this center outside of Sunday morning, hold your connection card near your heart. That symbolizes your giving for us and just give it a silent blessing and then we will send it on its way. And so it is. <laughs>
I saw good news for a lot of us that out in the lobby, Valeri has set up a table and there's some product out there. He's got several different CDs available so you can take a piece of him home with you if you'd like. That's the good news, right? Thank you for that. All right, so we have some announcements before we end with prayer today. First things first, we, um, many of us have bid on the Gourmets for God events, the wonderful variety of tasty, tasty events, uh, and so they are ready this morning. If you probably received an email notifying you that your bid was one of the winning, bid, winning bids, they are ready this morning to distribute tickets. If you can go over to the table on the patio and pay for your winning bid or bids, that would be great, and the tickets are available. They moved inside because it's winter, even though it's summertime, and so yes, they're going to be inside the great room instead. <laughs> and look, it's a visitor from where? The North Pole, oh, and yes. I bring you greetings. Santa sends his gratitude and his blessings. We are so, he is so grateful for all the wonderful gifts that you have given throughout the years. At our center, we choose children that are difficult to identify. They're the ones that fall through the cracks because there are many charities that do contribute to children at Christmas, Toys for Tots, Salvation Army, numerous other wonderful organizations. However, there are a few that do fall through the cracks. And fortunately, I worked with counselors at schools and so we're able to identify those that would just not normally receive Christmas because they're working or because there was some emergency and that took all the Christmas money. One of the interesting things about the children this year is that we have two families from two different schools, both of whom the dad has been injured with a traumatic brain injury. Both of families, the dad is in rehab right now, learning how to do simple things, like feed themselves because of the tra traumatic brain injury. In one family that's already been adopted, you don't have to worry about them, but the mother was killed and the children are now living with grandmother who was living on Social Security. As you can tell, there's probably not going to be a lot for Christmas in that family. The other one, the mom is disabled, but she is maintaining enough to, to provide a home and food for the kids. So these are the children that we identify. In the, supposedly was the courtyard, but the wind blew up too much, so we had to move inside the great room. There's a, a display where you have two ornaments for each child. One, you need to spend about $50 on each ornament. One is for clothes, one is for toys. So if you want to go shopping today, come by, pick up your ornaments, register with me so I don't lose any kids. And if you don't want to go shopping, or you just don't feel like you have that much cash to put out for one child, you bet you might have five or 10 you could donate. Or what if you just don't want to go shopping, but you have a lot of money? <laughs> we'll take that too. <laughs> and then a group of us go shopping just before school's out and get the, the gifts delivered to the parents so that they can be the Santa Claus which empowers the parents. So I am in the great room now, um, was in the courtyard with the gourmet for God, but the wind started blowing things around. Stop by, I will take any donations from a dollar to $10,000, whatever. And uh, if you are interested in shopping, we've got two weeks because the Everything is due back by December the 11th. So I'll see you in the great room. Thank you, Judy. All right. Oh, so we have, we have a book every month. This month's book to go along with our theme of wholeness is uh, the 10 things to do when your life falls apart. How about that? So anybody having change that's unexpected and your smile on your lips and a song in your heart's not quite your first response, then maybe that book can help you. The 10 things to do when your life falls apart. 20% off, no tax, no shipping over in our bookstore. Two day is the last Sunday for that one. Uh, this week we have a special Teze service because it's the fifth Wednesday we're going, I mean a special Wednesday service because it's fifth Wednesday, it's Teze. 
If you have not seen it, you got to see some of it and hear some of it if you were here early enough today. They were playing it on the screen. Magnificent music. Laura Hallett, one of our ministerial interns and practitioners, is facilitating or anchoring this service. Um, we're celebrating the living spirit, and she has asked each of us to pick a song that really inspires us or moves us spiritually, and so we're all choosing those, and it's going to be a profound evening of singing and prayer, meditation, and candle lighting at 7 o'clock. That's preceded every Wednesday by a bucket bowl at 5.30, that is... Um, uh, 5.30 to 6.30, you get a dollar, take a dollar to the window, you'll get a wonderful, delicious bowl of homemade soup or other things that show up, and that is good for an hour and wonderful, wonderful fellowship. Um, I was going to pass the microphone now to Sabrina, who wasn't able to be here, so I'm going to imitate Sabrina. <laughs> Howdy. I think it's because she was unable to be here last, or wasn't here last week to talk about the decorating. However, if you want to see Christmas, can you help make it happen? You know how gorgeous it can be. Anyway, Larry is going to also, the great room is going to be very full of activity today, but he's going to be over there because we want you to have some fellowship. But if you can stick around, you know, sometime during the fellowship, Larry's going to get the people who showed up and try to come over here, not try, he's going to come over here. And we're going to see what we can do in 60 to 90 minutes of, of making this place glorious and, and gorgeous for the holidays. If that can happen today, we're finished until the end of the season. So that would be great. So see Larry over in the great room today. Uh, and next Saturday already is the first Saturday of, a new, of uh, the last month of the quarter. That's December 3rd. That is cleanup day. So if you are able to join us any time between 9 a.m. and 2 p.m., the whole time or part of the time, please come. There are lots of wonderful projects outside and inside to help. Lunch is provided. It is our quarterly uh, opportunity to take tender, loving care of this facility that nourishes us so well. So that's next Saturday as well. Um, and Kelly Capsar is here. She's going to talk about an event next Sunday. Good morning. Um, I serve as part of the Vision Corps and under the direction of Colleen Tanaka, who was inspired to create Going Deeper Together as a community. Next week, I'm facilitating the Going Deeper. And what we're doing is um, a seven generation meditation. I started learning this pieces of this when I was seven, and it has been one of the practices for me that has brought me to a greater sense of wholeness. So, Anybody here have the experience of learning how to cook something? Maybe potatoes, maybe a ham that was cut in half, and you just think it's normal, right? And somehow you can trace it back and you find out that your great-grandmother started cutting the ham in half because it didn't fit in her oven if it was a whole ham, right? If my math is correct, and there are probably lots of you who will let me know if it is correct or incorrect. If we go back seven generations, there are 254 people that contributed to each of us being right here, right now. 254 people becoming one. Isn't that pretty cool? So with the seven generation meditation, we're going to go through and clear some of those beliefs that maybe don't work, that have been passed down through the cells, through the generation, through the DNA, and bring in things that support wholeness. It happens next Sunday between 12 and 1.30. There is no charge, and I hope you come and enjoy and come deeper together as a community with me. Thank you. Thank you. All right. One of the things that has been requested from our focus groups and others is more spiritual practice together, and that is a definite one that will be a profoundly moving experience. Free next Sunday at noon. And then the following Sunday, and two weeks from today already, is our holiday potluck, December 11th. Um, we are providing the turkey and everybody else. The, the center provides the turkey, and the rest of us bring all of the side dishes and desserts. There's a sign-up sheet in the lobby, so please sign up and tell us what you'll be bringing. And if you can, if you can help cook a turkey not help cook a turkey, if you can cook a turkey <laughs> to help all the turkeys that we need, talk to Jeannie. She'll be over in the great room in the kitchen area. Jeannie would like people to help um, uh, to pitch in and cook turkeys for that day on the 11th. So let her know if you can do that. And at long last, finally, did you bring something to eat today that, you're, that is over there waiting for us to go gobble up? Did you bring something for fellowship? Anything delicious? The whole back row. That's awesome. Well, thank you. You're going to be first in line. Good for you. Um, so... 
If you can help support that effort next Sunday and um, after, after the 11th, please do bring something delicious to eat or drink next Sunday, uh, specifically QTS, okay, U or Z. If your name starts with one of those letters, you can consider bringing something. And if you just feel the call, please do that as well. It's an opportunity for us to contribute to our own uh, sense of community and fellowship, and it's wonderful, and we're grateful for your generosity. And so all of that being said, most of that you'll find in the packet handed to you when you came in. The other things are posted on the uh, glass wall over in the great room. You can find out how to stay plugged in, especially uh, with up-to-the-minute up updates on our website. So please avail yourself of all of those opportunities. But now we're just going to set all of that aside and conclude our service with prayer and singing. So as we prepare for prayer, I'm inviting our ministry of prayer to stand. Our ministry of prayer is comprised of ministers and practitioners who are members here who have dedicated ourselves every single day to serve this community in prayer, affirmative prayer. We enter into that every single day, and we also will do that um, for specific requests. You have a space on your connection card. You can write a specific prayer request. You can email the ministry of prayer. The address is on your program. And there are cards in the lobby that you can fill out and uh, drop in a box. Those are all ways that we can get specific uh, requests to pray with. And you can get one-on-one -on -one personal prayer with a practitioner in the prayer room right after the service this morning. So all sorts of opportunity for prayer. And we're grateful to serve you in this way. And so as we are surrounded by this wonderful chamber of consciousness and power, we take in a deep breath and we let that breath out. And we set aside all of the activity, all of the words, all of the thoughts and move to this powerful place of contemplation. A place of entering into affirmative prayer. Prayer that seeks not to change God, but to remember the truth. A prayer that seeks not to control, but to allow. A prayer that affirms and doesn't request or beg or bargain. And that affirmation is one of life, vibrant life, wholeness, light, and truth. It is present in this space and around it, beyond all time and space, and yet filling every place, every moment. It is that one pure energy that I call God and that goes by many names. But it is the reality of this moment and this space of each one of us here, of the silence and the sounds, of the music and the meditation. It is the truth of each one of us. And in this moment, we are invited to breathe in and breathe out in whatever condition we are and to affirm wholeness, complete, not broken or damaged. That is the truth of who we are. And while we may experience physical conditions that seem less than whole or perfect, at the universal place and in the totality of our experience, Wholeness is who and what we are right now. So I accept it for myself and I accept it for each one here. I accept it for all who ever hear or see these words being spoken. Because I accept it as the truth of all creation. And that wholeness that is the vibrant, pure energy of God lives each of us in a complete way right now. And as we breathe in and breathe out in this moment, we are enlivened and empowered and awakened to that truth more fully than we ever have been. And we move forth into this season of light and joy, a time when many people are focusing on the conditions of peace and goodwill, and we simply know wholeness, oneness, unity. And we accept that our individualized soul is truly eternal and forever and ever expanding. And so I accept this reality here and now. I'm grateful for this space to remember it and this place that allows us to gather and to see and to know and to celebrate. And I give thanks in this moment for all life. 
for every life associated with this congregation and community. And I say a word of blessing for any change that is happening in anyone's life that is unexpected, unplanned, or maybe even unpleasant at this moment. I absolutely accept wholeness at the very center of it. The light of God, the presence of God, the peace and power of God moving through it and revealing itself in ways unimaginable at this moment. And I accept that we are blessed here now to know these truths and to live them. And so I let go. I let go in gratitude and I let go with a faith that is absolutely convinced that the truth once known is free to come forth into experience, to take shape and form in my life and our life. And as I give thanks, I let go. I release the word. These affirmations, they are complete. They are done and they are implanted in that infinite law that always works and it's always working. And so it's done. I let it go and together we release by saying, and so it is. I am letting go of the things that no longer serve me. As I'm letting go, God's revealed and I am whole. I am letting go of the things that no longer serve me. As I'm letting go, God's revealed and I am whole. I am letting go of the things that no longer serve me As I'm letting go, God's revealed and I am whole All right, last time, if and as you're able, go ahead and stand up. We'll finish by singing, I release. I release and I let go I let the Spirit run my life and my heart is open wide Yes, I'm only here for God No more struggle, no more strife With my faith I see the light I am free in the Spirit Yes, I'm only here for God I release and I let go I let the Spirit run my life and my heart is open wide Yes, I'm only here for God No more struggle, no more strife With my faith I see the light I am free in the Spirit Yes, I'm only here for God No more struggle, no more strife With my faith I see the light I am free in the Spirit, yes, I'm only here for God, yes, I'm only here for God, yes, I'm only here for God. Please, please reach out your hand, grab a hand on either side of you. And please say after me, something wonderful is happening through me right now. Something wonderful is happening through me right now. It is this thing called life. Life is in my mind. Life is in my body. Life is in everything I do. I am it. I receive it. I share it. And I accept it. Just the way that it is. And just the way that it is not. Thank you, life. Thank you, life. Amen.
And so in that loving gratitude, I simply release this prayer into the law, into the creative mind of spirit, knowing that nothing is too great nor too small for God's divine right action. I simply let this be, and together we say, and so it is. I am opening up in sweet surrender to the luminous love light of the one. I am opening up in sweet surrender to the luminous love light of the one. I am opening